Well, good afternoon, everyone. You know, I have to say, going last is uh, tough after all these great speakers with everything everyone said, and I know I stand before you and cocktail hour. So, <laughs> I get that that may not be the best place, but it is truly an honor to be here. You know, um, I have spent the last few weeks and days considering the question of the glass ceiling, and I do get asked this quite often. And so, you know, here it is. Usually when I get asked the question about it, I answer it in two parts. You know, when I graduated uh, and went to work in a largely male-dominated industry of commercial and corporate lending, I certainly got the sense that I might have been, you know, hired to address that female quota requirement. And yes, there were incidences, by the way, in the beginning of my career that the old boys club was certainly alive and well. Some sexist remarks, some biases. And yes, I did feel that I probably had to be better, prove that I was driven, you know, committed and more able than my male counterpart just to get the equal opportunity. But you know, what I think it did was it motivated me. It truly made me want to prove to them and to myself that I had a right to sit at that table. And you know, I kind of liken it to working out with weights. It just made me stronger. You know, the second thing I think above all is, and we've heard this already by so many of us who've stu stood up here, is we need to believe that we are only limited by our own dreams and expectations. Now, I, I know that may sound naive or maybe altruistic, but hear me out. You know, maybe it's that we have to think more of the glass ceiling as a metaphor for barriers and obstacles and the challenges that get in our way. But you know, it's how we deal with them. That's what defines us. You know, I'm not dismissive of the challenges that other women truly face or they've pursued or their dreams and goals. And I can only share with you my experiences, you know, and, as, and my views as I've formulated them based on my path to where I am. Some days, you know, it really is the adversity, the challenge that helps define the goal and the ambition. Until you want something and you can't have it, I think that's when you really, really understand what you want. And you actually have to figure out at that point what you need to learn, what you need to endure, and yes, sometimes what you have to give up to get it. You know, life isn't fair. And uh, we, all, we don't all come from the same background or the same economic place. And we may not have all actually had the care and feeding of a loving, supportive family who told us that we could be anything we wanted to be and like I did have. And I absolutely understand that much of my success is, has been contributed because of my upbringing. And you know, sometimes if that ambition is that easy or too easy, I don't think we force ourselves to learn the skills, acquire the knowledge and the experience that is necessary to survive and do the job. You know, I truly believe that if you want something, you have to go get it. And you have to you know, realize that when one door closes, another door opens. And you need to have the courage and the confidence to step through it. You know, I love Sheryl Sandberg's book, and I know there's been some references to it. And, and I have it here. And I don't know if you've all, is, has anybody read it? Is there a show of hands? Everybody knows it. I have to say, for me, I think this book speaks to this topic better than anything that I might share and certainly adds to the dialogue that we've heard this afternoon. I recommend if you haven't, re you know, you, if you haven't, please read it. You know, there are more women graduating from colleges and universities in a wider variety of sectors and degrees than ever before, for sure. More women starting businesses. And yes, more women, you know, um, supporting fa families either in a dual income or a single income or maybe as a single parent. And, you know, I guess the question is why aren't there more women CEOs, more women on boards, and why more women in management positions? I know, I know there should be, and we should have more equal representation there. But I want to share this from my experience. I don't think there's ever one path to get to where we want to be. I like Sheryl Sandberg's comment that it's, it's more of a jungle gym than, than a ladder. You know, the, when we start out on our journey, we never know what obstacles will deter us, what challenges or even distractions, really, that, um, that will cause us. The path isn't straight. And by the way, I don't think there is only one way to get there. You know, I had no idea when I graduated that at 34 years of age that I would start a mattress retailer 
that we would build 252 stores, we would become the number one mattress retailer and company in, the, in, uh, in Canada, and that I would be on TV, radio, and on the internet as the face of sleep country. And you know, my path to get to there was very different than my co-founding partner, business partner, Steve Gunn. He is also an Ivy grad. He was an engineer. He worked at McKinsey. He had a venture cap company. And 20 years ago, we partnered together. Our offices um, adjoin each other. And together now, with an amazing team and committed, passionate associates, we've built Sleep Country. I always have to drink a glass of water. I don't know. It always makes me feel better. All right. But you know, looking back, by the way, I have to share with you that when I was interviewed coming out of university, you know, I would bristle when interviewers, and they were usually male, would ask me where I saw myself in five years. Because, you know, I thought they were trying to figure out my ambition, and truthfully, they were trying to figure out if I was going to have a family. And I would answer that question very honestly. I said, I don't know. I don't know, because it all depends on what that company is going to offer me. And, you know, I realized then, and the fact that I could not guarantee my loyalty to that company, just as they couldn't guarantee that in five years they were wanting to, to keep me there and hire me. You know, the truth is, is that I got that the employee-employer relationship is a very two-way street. And there is that give and take, you know, one of development, growth, performance, and reward. And if that's not what you're experiencing, it's time to move on. You know, as it turns out, I didn't have my kids until I was in my late 30s and early 40s. And had I leaned out, or had I made choices in my career to protect the fact that I wanted to have children, then I wouldn't be standing here today. And I would have never accepted the opportunity to start Sleep Country. Sold everything we own, move out west to start the company. You know, I cannot tell you had I had kids if I would have made that same decision. But I can tell you that when I, um, that I still intended to have children when we started Sleep Country, and in fact, I was trying to at the time. I wasn't sure how it was all going to work out. You know, I think I was going to just cross that bridge when I got to it. And, in, and uh, I had my first girl, Riley, in August of 1997. We had just opened our 46th store. We were just opening Calgary in September of that year. And, uh, and I, and I remember going in and having to tell my business partners that I was pregnant prior to that. And I thought, you know, now that was no small task. And to their credit, by the way, they were truly happy for me. Now, true, I didn't take a lot of time off. I took a few weeks off because I naively thought that I was going to bring my daughter into the office. OK, that lasted like one day, and I realized that was a disastrous idea. And I did have to get a nanny, and I was hoping I didn't. But as it turned out, you have to do what you have to do. And I, I did continue to work crazy hours, still committed, still passionate. But as I began that juggling act, and that's what we've heard so much about this afternoon, you know, of trying to do it all, family, business, I had to learn to delegate. And I came to appreciate the fact that my team were ready, able, and willing. And as often case, they did the job better than I probably ever would have been able to. You know, just as a sidebar, I have to say that it was funny that I'm not sure if my partners really had assessed the risk of me getting pregnant. Uh, maybe they did behind closed doors. They had those conversations, but not with me. I do know, though, at the board, we talked about the risk if I were to die because we were branding the company around sleep country, around, around me. And, you know, somehow everybody really got comfortable with that. <laughs> so what was going to be kids? But, you know, I have to say, I think they thought there was going to be some press around it, you know, and uh, some media frenzy. So now, if we're having a few slow days at the stores, I look under my car as I'm about to leave from the office, you know. <laughs> you never know. All kidding aside, We've talked about having it all. It's the comment we continue to hear as everyone gets up here. You know, family, work, careers, commitments. I think it's a myth. And each of us has to deal with those realities. And it's not about having it all. I think we might want to think it's about doing it all and keeping our sanity and our happiness. And yes, I'm going to say it, balance. 
And you know, I, I thought about whether or not, and I wasn't gonna speak about balance initially, you know, when I was putting together my comments, but I had to keep coming back to it. I kept thinking about what it takes to juggle life's demands and who had made it possible in my life to pursue my dreams and goals. And by the way, I'm reminded that this conversation of today, which is so important, is a very different conversation in Canada than it would be in any other country or in some other countries. You know, I do think we are privileged to live in, in Canada and in, in here, where women's rights are discussed, they are defended. It isn't perfect, and it does get, have to get better. But I, would want to, I, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else or raise my two girls than here in Canada. So first off, you know, I believe doing it all is coming to the terms and acceptance of life is constantly juggling act and it's ever changing and it's really different for everyone. You know, I always thought that life was gonna get a little easier as we got older, but it doesn't. I think it gets way more complex because of the issues and the decisions, business or at home, children, aging parents, you know, things that are outside of my comfort zone. There isn't a day that I have to make some a decision or something comes out that I, I don't know the answer, or the fact is, is that I just don't feel like I'm getting everything done. You know, I've come to believe that balance is getting comfortable with the fact that I'm always gonna be just a little uncomfortable. I think it is a frame of mind that may be directly proportional to how many activities we put on our plate, and it's also discovering who we are and finding the understanding and acceptance in the choices we make. You know, I echo Sandberg's comments, and we've talked a lot about it in the panel and just before, but the single most important career decision a woman can make is whether she will have a life partner, and if she does, who is that partner? You know, I have been fortunate, like many who stood before you here, is that I have found a great life partner in my husband now. You know, we've been married 29 years this February, we dated nine years before that. I know what you're thinking, how can that be? I'm so young. <laughs> Okay, maybe you're not thinking that, but okay. You know, when I, when I decided to start Sleep Country, Al was writing on a TV show, and he was getting traction on his career, which is to have produced a comedy show, which, by the way, later on he ended up doing. But he did support my decision, and he agreed to quit his job and move out to Vancouver and help us start the company. And sure, you know, we look brilliant today, but I have to tell you, at the time, all our friends and a lot of our colleagues thought, you know, we're, we were crazy. You know, I was giving up a well-paying, very secure job at the bank to start a chain of mattress stores. You know, <laughs> Al has always been there to build me up. He, um, he certainly, um, especially when I'm down or troubled, he always takes my side, unless we're arguing, that is. <laughs> but he is my confident, my best friend, and my biggest cheerleader. You know, I also have an extremely great business partner in Steve Gunn. And over the years, we have become great friends. And we share the same vision and the understanding and what's important to our business. And our skills and our abilities, by the way, are very complimentary. Steve and Gord gave me the opportunity to join them and start Sleep Country Canada, and I seized it. They saw in me what I aspired to be, a president running a sustainable, profitable business and building a place, a culture where our team feels inspired, recognized and rewarded. You know, I do think that women need to seize their opportunities and they have to have the confidence that we have the ability and the brains to take on new challenges. You know, I certainly laid awake many nights and as the mattress lady, I probably should never ever admit that. <laughs> but, and I did worry always about those number of decisions I had to make and the work that had to be done and the challenges and the issues, whether it was as I was being promoted at the bank into more senior roles or as we started and built our business. You know, I didn't always have all the skills that I needed to do to take that and get that promotion or take, and I, and I had fears, but I did have the desire and the aptitude to learn. And you know, I continue to learn and I continue to get better, I think, every day. In Lean In, Sheryl Sandberg writes about not leaving your job until you've left. She encourages each of us to raise our hand, to put up your hand and ask for that promotion. No one is ever truly ready for the next job or you know, the promotion or the assignment that you think. You know, and at the end of the day, there is risk for sure. We could fail, we may not be ready, or we may not get the support from the company that, that makes us successful. 
But at the end of the day, if you go for it, you will never lie awake at night and wonder what if. In my experience, I have generally had the support from individuals that have helped me be successful in the jobs I've taken on. And, you know, when I wasn't, I still learned such great lessons, you know, about my skills, myself, or what it would take for me to be successful the next time. You know, I used to always think that business was non-gender, kind of like sports. And when I was little, I played a lot of sports, field hockey, gymnastics, baseball, volleyball. And I used to correct my male friends because they would always say to me that I throw like a guy. And I said, no, I throw the ball the way it should be. There is no male or female way to do it. It's just the correct way. You know, when I was at the bank 20 years ago, or when I was at the bank in my late 20s, you know, I was, a, I was a, a, asked to attend a banking workshop for women leaders. And I'd said no, because I said, you know, I kind of thought, why does there have to be a program, a course on that it's different for women than men? But you know, more and more, I've come to understand that women benefit from mentoring and networking groups with other women, and that's what this is about, and we've heard that. You know, we are different than men, duh, but we like to talk about work, we're really good at it, but we also need to share about our families, experiences and the struggle to juggle life's, you know, complexities. And these events like today, you know, the mentoring, the workshops and the sessions can help affirm and motivate. And sometimes, you know, as we face those roadblocks, adversity and challenges, it's these events or connections we have with other women who are in these roles that share their experiences, that's what gives us perspective and often the, the chance for us to make sure that we'll persevere. I still fight the urge, by the way, to stay silent at the boardroom. I know that most of my team would never agree with that, but I, what they don't know, I do force myself to make sure that I say something. I challenge myself to put my hand up because we have to, we have to say what we believe. And each time you test your voice, your confidence grows, your influence grows, and your ideas. You know, the glass ceiling canon certainly does exist, and we've heard that in various um, industries and at various levels, I think, within organization. But I think sometimes we contribute to it. We may even um, create it because of the presence of our own fears and insecurities. When I was 28-ish, my corporate banking department was being broken up and we were reallocated, by the way, as part of the bank's decision to reorganize. And my VP at the time, who was male, made two very lasting impressions on me that have actually inspired both my leadership style but also my aspirations. First, he showed me that it was okay to be authentic as he emotionally announced that we were being disbanded. The learning, his emotion was a sign of, of not of weakness, but rather an indication that he truly cared about us and that made an indelible impression on me. And secondly, later he came into my office a few, uh, that week and he, and he told me that I should consider leaving the bank and go run a business. He said that I will be a president one day. You know, I didn't end up leaving the bank for another four years until I went off to start Sleep Country, but his comments, you know, his confidence and belief in me was tremendous and very important in supporting my aspirations and goals. So as one door closes, another door opens. The work we do can be the difference of opening that door. I met my future business partners through the bank. And when we started Sleep Country, it was decided, as well as being the president and operating the business, that I would be the spokesperson. But I knew that I would have to deal with the misconception, and by the way, my own insecurities and fears, that people might think that I was only the spokesperson. I can't tell you how many times people have come up to me or have asked my sales associates or our delivery crew if I was really the president. And may I suggest, had I been a male, that question might not be asked as often. And I was really careful, by the way. I was 34 when we started Sleep Country, and, and I was careful with, with the image and, and, the, and, the, and the way the company was going to be portrayed in the press. And so when I was doing an interview and we were going to get a chance to do a, um, uh, a picture, I always wanted to take it into the store because I always wanted them to see what the store looked like and our selection and our team. And I also knew that the photographer was gonna to try to take a picture that would be interesting or funny. And they would always ask me to sprawl on the mattress. And I never would. My husband just says I have no sense of humor. But, 
You know, the truth is, is that I wanted, and more importantly, I needed to be taken seriously and credibly. And I also wanted my company to be taken seriously. And it was all about that process of professionalism, trustworthiness, and being credible. You know, this spring, I had the privilege of introducing Oprah Winfrey at Cops Coliseum, in front of 12,000 people, by the way. And, you know, to be honest, I, deep down, certainly I did want to do it, but I really didn't want to do it. And uh, because I, I really thought that I needed to figure some great excuse so that I could say no, because I knew it was going to be scary. Maybe my worst nightmare. I had managed my public persona for the last 18 years, you know, to avoid the risk of public embarrassment. That is, if you don't count our ads. But <laughs> I had just read Lean In, and I felt compelled to push myself and take that risk. And also, my marketing director, Laura Baker, who's here today, I don't think she would have accepted a no for an answer. So, but I have to say that I. I like the quote that both Oprah and Sheryl Sandberg have on the walls in their office, and it, and it is, what would I do if I were not afraid to fail? And I love that saying. It conjures up in my mind all sorts of things that I would do if I knew I had that safety net. And you know, because I heard that and I read that and I read this book, I said, I have to do it. You know, and at the end of the day, you know, the, the evening went pretty well. You know, I didn't faint or fall off the stage, which was good. But what was very clear to me in that moment as I stood there and I looked down and my husband was there and my two daughters was the fact that their presence gave me strength and I wanted to be great for them. I had faced my fears that, by the way, threatened to take away a very good opportunity for me and for our business and maybe a once in a lifetime, you know, um, experience. I could have walked away. But if I did, I would have regretted it. I share this because I want to suggest that limitations are often less about an organization as it is about our emotional state. And it's sometimes a combination of fears mixed with pressures at the time that can combine to feel and be insurmountable. I had a woman reporter do a pretty good hatchet job on me a few years ago. She had stated in her article, not to expect much from me in the future, and that my success may have been more good luck than planning or ability. You know, or at least that's how I interpreted it as I read it. But as I look back at that time of that article, which is almost 10 years ago, I had just lost my dad, and my girls were two and five, and I was grappling with the issues, you know, of pressure of being a good mom, a daughter, a wife, running a growing business all at the same time. And you know, it had been a moment of unguarded honesty from me. I'd shared that I truly began to value the, the idea of um, importance of reflection and family and friends, striving to live in the moment, and we've talked about that, and yes, playing dolls with my girls. I guess somehow that must have appeared weak or pathetic or somehow distracted from business. So the article seemed, and by the way, that article seemed all the more hurtful for me because it was a, a female reporter and I did feel betrayed. I was mortified and just a little broken. It took me months, by the way, to trust or accept another interview. But at the same time, as the president, you know, I wanted and needed Sleep Country Canada to be in the press and help support our top of mind awareness. However, the personal risk now was seemed too much for me. For a while there, I let that article affect me. I gave the person, the reporter, that article, the power to control my happiness, and I let them become my glass ceiling. You know, the article wasn't nice, but certainly my colleagues and friends didn't think it was that bad. And at any other time in my life, it may not have affected me the same way. I had plenty of great articles to balance off that hurt, so why was it so impactful? You know, and I, and I have to say, I think I'd lost perspective. I was feeling overwhelmed by trying to do it all, you know, and I was trying to figure out priorities personally and professionally, and questioning if I could do it. And more importantly, did I want to do it? And that article touched those fears. So, you know, seeing things clearly, keeping life in perspective, not taking myself too seriously, and being able to forgive myself for being that vulnerable was hard. But I learned a very important lesson, that it didn't matter what she thought or anybody else for that matter. It only mattered what I thought, what I believed in, and at what I wanted to do. Every challenge can be defeating. 
if we let it. But you know, at the end of the day, it can also open up endless possibilities and understanding of what really counts. I love a quote that I heard at that evening with, with, um, with Oprah in April. And every day you get to paint on the canvas that is your life, creating more vibrancy sometimes, bringing things into focus as we begin to evolve ourselves. And as to that glass ceiling, well, maybe we should think of it more as a mirror that reflects the heights we want to climb or the dreams we want to chase. And as we get closer to that mirror, maybe we should reach up and tip it skyways so we see the next dream, the next climb, the next goal. And as we look in the mirror, we see the reflections of the faces that have helped us along the way. And just maybe, as we look down, the faces of those that thought we would never get there. So I just thought, I think absolutely that we are only limited by our own dreams and expectations. At least that's what I want to believe. And that's what I tell my girls, is that they pursue their dreams and aspirations. So thank you, WXN, for the opportunity for being here and to be honored this evening. It means so much to be recognized among the amazing, talented, and passionate women that you will honor tonight and have honored in the past. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure being here.